Welcome, welcome to uh, Spring to STEM series and uh, really happy to talk to you about uh, something that is uh, really close to my heart and uh, has to do with uh, essentially engineering materials and uh, creating materials that better serve society. The title of this talk is about quest, really a search for materials that are exceptional, unique or in some way remarkable. And uh, just to uh, talk a little bit about the background of this uh, type of research and, you know, really this type of uh, motivation, uh, I just wanted to put this, this, this question forward about what really are engineering materials. There is engineering that most people know uh, very well about, and of course there is material science, but what are engineering materials? And of course, uh, what is the purpose of engineering materials? Okay. Um, I wanted to bring this uh, forward with something that is an example that uh, maybe is in our everyday life. And uh, just think about an object, right? Uh, an object that uh, you see every day and think about how it's changed in history. It could be your favorite toy, for example. It could be uh, objects that are around you, desks, um, even things that you use in your everyday life, like vacuum cleaners and so on, chairs, things like that. Um, an example that I wanted to bring uh, up is this bicycle, right? Bicycles are, are everywhere. And if you think about how the design of bicycles has changed through the years, you know, you, you, you think that not just the geometry of the bicycle, the size of the wheels, the frame and so on has changed, uh, but also how people use it. Uh, think, for example, that when bicycles were started to use, they were generally leisure type of equipment. People in the 1800s, for example, you can see a design in here, they would use them to just go around the park and uh, amuse themselves with them. And then uh, when uh, uh, things evolved a little bit, in the design and in the use of uh, the bicycle, you know, we started to see applications about transportation more and more. Uh, these are some iconic designs, penny farthing you can see here in the middle, uh, uh, and uh, then some other designs going forward through the years. And uh, this diagram here in the bottom show all the years and also some innovations, right, that happened in the bicycle designs. Uh, the reason you might know of this uh, very large wheel in the penny farthing was to uh, give an appropriate ratio of the effort that was needed to push, propel the bike forward and the speed uh, that was required on average for it. Then, uh, of course, gears were started to, uh, uh, to, to be invented. Uh, these things like ball bearings, you know, they started to, to, to get involved into this uh, design of the bicycles. You can see a lot of different other uh, types of innovations here, the spoked wheel, chain drive, free wheel, etc. And so uh, essentially the bicycle now started to evolve and become more practical and uh, more usable really. You'll see here that also the materials start to take more and more of a, 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 a chief role in the design of these bicycles. And indeed, if you think about how this penny farthing was made, most likely you would imagine that this saddle here was made of uh, some leather. Uh, the body generally was made of um, wood. Okay, and uh, generally these bicycles would have solid rubber uh, tubes. Uh, then moving forward, all of these things changed. And um, yes, if you think about where we are at the moment, we're using more and more lightweight materials, generally metals, but also much more uh, composite materials now. You might have heard, for example, of uh, glass fiber in false polymers. Here they started to be used in the 60s primarily. Uh, titanium alloys, they were made affordable around this time magnesium alloys, aluminum alloys, very lightweight metals. And then the composites, carbon fiber reinforced composite, Kevlar fiber reinforced composites. And you can see here these MMCs towards the 2000s. This stands for metal matrix composites. Okay, so lots of innovations in here. And uh, if you think about the role that materials play here, you'll find out that essentially it's not just the availability of materials that matters, but also the purpose of these materials. Things, for example, like uh, how lightweight these materials are, how strong they are, and how suitable they are to be made into these tubes that are required, for example, or thin wires that are required for the spokes play a hugely important role in here. So how about today? Uh, here is uh, a bicycle that could 
be, and it indeed is of, uh, of the present time. It is made uh, exclusively from composite materials, carbon fiber uh, reinforced polymers in this case. And um, for those of you who have experience with these types of bikes, you know that they are super lightweight. They are very, very stiff, so really good for racing, but they have some disadvantages, namely that they are not very resistant to uh, fracture, for example. And uh, the other thing is that they are not uh, recyclable. Composites are very, very cha challenging to re recycle. So this is a present. It's an example of a material that really uh, meets very well uh, the, the, the criteria of uh, mechanical design. And this other one is also uh, an example of present design. It's a bicycle that is made from um, bamboo, from bamboo stalks that are uh, joined together. Uh, it's something that you see now, not so much maybe in the streets, but that is being used much more uh, recently, going after the concept of sustainable design and sustainable materials. Uh, this is an example. These are our students here in 2017, uh, designing a cargo bicycle. And they went through the entire process from uh, designing it uh, for reliability and strength to designing it for manufacturing, looking at the joints, uh, doing the structural analysis. And you can see here this example just in front of our campus of uh, uh, the students with the cargo bicycle. Okay, so, uh, well, so going back to the questions, what are engineering materials? Uh, essentially, these are materials that are designed in a very particular way. To have some advantages, some unique properties, some improved properties, and some properties that really makes them uh, different from uh, uh, present materials and makes them suitable for design. Okay? And then if we think about the question, why do we do this? Why bother to make new materials or engineer materials? Why change things, really? You'll find out that uh, it's the requirements that we just discussed now, essentially mechanical requirements, uh, and uh, much more recently, sustainability requirements. Where do we get the materials? What do we do with them? And most importantly, what is their end of life path? Okay. All of these are uh, uh, very important considerations in really uh, setting the scene for uh, engineering materials and creating new materials. Uh, so what I'll do with the rest of the talk is talk about some examples. Uh, of these types of special materials or uh, uh, interesting materials. Uh, and uh, I will draw from my research uh, some of examples and some other examples uh, I will draw from just the general field of uh, engineering materials. The field is very large. There are a lot of people working uh, on this and uh, continuously improving really uh, what we make and how we make things. Uh, I will focus on some very specific field that has to do with uh, hybrid materials or composite materials. Okay, I'll start with um, uh, this very simple chart. Uh, it shows how materials are arranged in space. And here we are arranging them in terms of the density, the weight or how heavy they are. And uh, in the y-axis here, we have uh, stiffness of the material how resistant it is, in other words, to deformation in the elastic regime. So you see here that very heavy materials, but also very stiff materials are the metals. Ceramics, likewise, is this, this yellow bubble in here. Uh, they are uh, likewise uh, heavy, but uh, even more uh, stiff. Okay? And then you, you see here in the middle somewhere, we have natural materials, woods, right? Uh, rubbers and so on. And all the plastics you see here in the big uh, um, blue bubble. So these are the solid materials. They, they just essentially occupy a particular space into this trade-off between heaviness and uh, stiffness. And the idea is that really what we want is something that is as lightweight as possible and uh, as strong or as stiff as possible. And one way to do it is to combine material and air material and space. Okay, so these are some examples here of um, hybrids of material and space. These are foams, uh, sponges, um, and uh, when you think about getting more and more sophisticated, we can think about uh, honeycombs, for example. These are the types of things that you would see in, um, generally for packaging, in cardboard boxes and so on, you can see these there. Uh, they are very efficient in absorbing energy. And going even further now to, towards uh, getting 
smart arrangement in space, you can think about these uh, little pyramids that are in space uh, arranged in such a way to give uh, high properties, high strength, high stiffness at low density. And um, it, well, so generally the idea is to uh, smartly arrange uh, material in space so that you can get good properties. And one type of idea is to think about how uh, the surface of these uh, materials determines their function. You know, for example, from intuition that a beam uh, bends much easier in this way than in this way. Okay? So a lot of, of, of the mechanical properties have to do with something that is called the second uh, moment of area. Okay, So how easy this bends. In other words, if you position the material in such a way that is uh, farthest away from something that is called the neutral axis, it's much more resistant. Right, So a tube is more resistant to bending than a little wire, even for the same amount of material. And so uh, these are two examples from my research is about how to modify the surface of these uh, type of uh, lattices to make them stronger. This first example is about using nanocrystalline materials to uh, uh, use them as coating, strong coatings. And uh, the idea is that when you uh, control the grain size of metals, when you make it smaller and smaller and smaller, they become stronger okay, because of the reason uh, of plastic deformation in metals. So that's one. Uh, another one is uh, taking advantage of something that is called anodizing, uh, which is a process that converts a metal into a ceramic. Okay? Uh, essentially, the process is very simple. You take away metal cations from, um, uh, from the metal surface, and that is substituted by oxygen. Right, So that creates uh, uh, a ceramic uh, surface on the outside. This is a very common process. So you'll see uh, anodized surfaces of these MacBooks, for example. Uh, they are they are very tough, right? And they are very protective of the of this surface. Okay, so same idea we had on uh, getting these coatings around uh, little lattices, right? To make them uh, stronger. Okay, so these are some examples. That's a little uh, micro lattice that is reinforced with uh, a nanocrystalline sleeve. You can see how it deforms. And that's another one that is reinforced with ceramic on the outside. Okay, so you can see that it's, it kind of crushes and doesn't deform so uh, uh, in such a ductile way, right? Uh, this is just a summary of all of this research. Um, the most interesting thing here is this graph on the right-hand side that uh, tells about how density, right, can control the, the strength of this material. You see that when you convert aluminum into aluminum oxide, right? You convert the surface into ceramic. You can get a lot of strength with essentially no weight penalty. You don't add anything; you just transform the surface. And uh, when you add this layer of reinforcing uh, uh, nanocrystalline nickel around the lattice, you get uh, strength increase for sure, but at the expense of density. Okay, and then pushing the boundaries now. Where do we go from here? Um, here is an example of the lightest known material. It's called aerographene, and uh, it's essentially an aerogel. Okay, so it's it's a, a material that has a lot of uh, air bubbles inside. Typically, in the ninety percent of uh, volume fraction is air, and uh, is uh, seven point five less dense than air. Okay, so there is very very little material here in this uh, uh, in this. Uh, in this aer aerographene. Okay, so it doesn't float in air because this, these uh, ligaments of graphene have air inside, so the weight of air weighs it down, but uh, just the density of it, the density, of, in other words, the mass divided by volume is uh, smaller than that of air. Strange, right? But uh, it's, it shows you the extent to which we have uh, reached in this engineering of materials. Uh, okay, so something else. How about making materials for unique properties? As you might expect, when we stretch a material, okay, it wants to conserve the volume. So when we stretch it, uh, it constricts in volume, right? We, we stretch it in the uh, in this direction, up and down. In the uh, left and right, it will want to become smaller. When we compress it, it will want to become bigger, right? To conserve the volume. And now that's a conventional material. A class that is called oxetic material uh, has the complete opposite property. When you stretch it, it becomes bigger, larger in the transverse direction. And when you compress it, it becomes smaller, right? Uh, and uh, it's something strange, but it can be uh, done 
again by this principle of engineering materials. So this is a design like that. When you pull it up, essentially these beams straighten, right? And then uh, the entire uh, structure expands, right? Uh, this is some example of our research in here, looking at uh, a lattice that is called uh, a cubic car lattice. It essentially, it is designed in such a way that uh, when you compress it in one direction, this beam bends and uh, constrict the volume so that this uh, lattice essentially uh, becomes smaller and smaller in volume. What are they used for? Uh, here's an application. Uh, soles of shoes uh, are uh, you know, generally finding this type of application. Typically, the sports industry is the one that is much more experimental, right? Because there, uh, any uh, uh, little bit of uh, improvement makes a huge difference in the performance of athletes and so on. So essentially, the idea here is that when you have a sole that is made from this material that uh, uh, constricts when it's compressed, you step on it. Right, and a lot of the energy is absorbed by the constricting material, and then when you release the sole, okay, this material expands and it kind of gives you a spring up in your step. Okay, just uh, uh, you know some idea about not uh, just having a unique property, but also uh, using it to for something that is useful and uh, uh, applicable. Okay, and then uh, another class of material, the final one that I have to give as an example is uh, engineering materials for sustainability. Again, this is part a lot of uh, part of my research and has to do with looking after uh, looking at all of these um, foams that are used for insulation, polystyrene, polyethylene, polyurethane, and so on. Uh, all of them are extremely good in what they do in protecting us essentially from the cold and the, the hot weather outside, but they are not recyclable and not biodegradable. So we've been looking for a long time for something that is uh, sustainable and can replace them. So this is a project that we work on at the moment, and it's uh, uh, looking at exploiting strong cellulose fibers uh, that you can get from bamboo, right? An example like this here is a bamboo, and it's made of a lot of fibers, uh, and uh, exploiting their strength to create uh, foams like this one that you can see in here uh, is very interesting. Okay, because uh, it's a product that is biodegradable, uh, and if we are able to uh, control the size of the spores inside there, we can also make it um, uh, very thermally insulating, and of course, looking at the manufacturing feasibility to make it as uh, affordable as the current uh, plastic forms. Okay. Uh, that's what I, I forgot. So this is an example of um, of this foam, just so you can see that some things, some details about the pores in there and uh, the fibers and how they work together to create this um, the, this porous structure. All right. So those were some examples. Um, then, so we talked about uh, engineering materials for strength and lightweight, unique and unusual properties, and sustainability. These are just three examples. Uh, there are three examples really about taking a challenge of the present and answering it. But what is even more important and much more interesting is to predict what the challenges will be for the future. And indeed, how we can uh, think about what we can do now to meet these types of challenges.